So thank you for joining this uh, GDPR refresh and review session. Um, for anybody who doesn't know me, my name is um, Mark Gracie. Um, I run Mark Gracie GDPR. I've been involved in data protection compliance in one way or another, um, and uh, as well as some other data related regulations um, since the Data Protection Act 1998 came into force. Um, and so uh, I've, I've been working with um, businesses over the last uh, four-ish, four and a half years on GDPR compliance specifically, uh, and looking at some of the privacy uh, compliance as well for, for things like marketing and, and the use of cookies. Um, so that's just a bit of background about, about me. What we're gonna be covering today is, uh, I'm gonna do a quick overview of uh, GDPR. So looking at some of the basics of, of GDPR compliance and, and what it means. Um, a look at what has changed since May 2018 when GDPR came into force on the 25th of May uh, 2018. Um, some of the issues that lots of businesses uh, tend to, to struggle with in one way or another, um, and also look at um, where things are at with uh, the sort of the compliance environment right now with regards to, to data protection. And there's a, a few uh, interesting and exciting things, and I fully get that it might just be me that finds them interesting and exciting, um, around GDPR and, and data protection compliance, which uh, I think is worth everybody uh, knowing about. So, so essentially, a quick overview um, of the GDPR basics, um, a look at some of the things that have changed um, and how it impacts on businesses and, and what, uh, what things you can look forward to um, now and into the future with um, some time for a Q&A at the end. So let's start with the, the refresh part. Um, so let's start with definitions. So there's quite a few definitions in the GDPR, um, but I, I tend to focus on these six. So uh, just to really set the scene as to what this means in, in reality and, and certainly some of the terms that I use as, uh, as we go through. So data protection is all about personal data. So that's any information that can be used to identify an individual, um, whether that's an individual directly or indirectly. So if you have a pot of data which doesn't look like it's personal data, but there's something in it, like I say, a, a customer ID, which you can then cross-reference with another pot of data, then both pots of data are considered personal data. Equally, any records or information you store about an individual would also constitute personal data. So if you've got a customer database or a CRM and you record in the notes in the, say the CRM about something about the uh, individual, then that forms part of their personal data as well. There is a subclass of personal data called special category of data. And that data is um, uh, various different things which the GDPR requires you to take extra special care with and there's extra uh, conditions that need to, to apply to, to the processing of that data and it's things like health and medical information, sexual orientation, religious beliefs, trade union membership, biometric data used for identification purposes, genetic data um, and, and, and recently um, potentially um, whether you're a, um, a, a follower of the ethics of, of veganism for example. Um, those kind of uh, beliefs and um, uh, and uh, the way you look at uh, things about the way you live could potentially be considered uh, special category data. Everything you do with the data is processing and processing has a very wide definition. It's important to always remember that because um, that enables you to understand exactly how and where you're processing your data in the first place. Um, but uh, essentially everything you do. So you'll have data for a specific purpose and you'll be processing it for that specific purpose. But if you edit, delete, manipulate, share, um, add to um, and do anything else with that data, you are processing that data. And, and as I say, that has uh, implications um, across the GDPR in terms of understanding some of the things that you have to put in place. And then you have the three key actors um, when it comes to data protection. So you have a data subject, a data controller, and a data processor. So the data subject is the individual whose data is being processed. The controller is the organization that's collecting the data from the data subject and is going to do something with it. And the data controller may use a third party to do some kind of processing of that data, or, or they may incidentally have access to, to some of the personal data, and they would be a data processor. And 
this is another example of where the wideness of uh, the definition of processing is important because if you store data in the cloud, um, use Microsoft or Google um, Drive or, or um, a CRM like HubSpot, for example, they're storing your data. And whilst they're not, you're not instructing them to do something specific with them, with it for you, um, they are storing your data and therefore that's constitute processing. So they would be a processor. So in a very simplistic email marketing model, for example, you collect email addresses, you would be the data controller, the email addresses relate to the data subjects, you use MailChimp to send out your email marketing, so you put the email addresses in MailChimp, MailChimp would be a, a data processor. So that's the subject controller and, and processor and, and some of the, the key definitions um, within uh, GDPR. Now in terms of the um, rules about what you can and can't do with data these are governed by what are called principles and under gdpr there are seven principles the principle of lawfulness fairness and transparency you have to be open and transparent basically and we'll talk about lawfulness in a second when we talk about the lawful basis for processing but um it should never be a surprise to any individual to find that their data is being processed in a particular way and that's why lawfulness um in terms of what you have to do but also the fairness of, of um, and transparency around what you're doing um, has to be clear to, to the individual. You should only process the data for the specific purpose that you, you need it. If you want to use it for something else, you will have to consider whether it's lawful for you to do so and assign a lawful basis accordingly. You have to um, only collect the data that you need. So um, there is a, a principle of of minimization and and that's about uh, keeping the data relevant so don't ask for data that you think you may need in the future but you don't need right now you should only limit it to the amount of data that you need so only collect the minimal amount of data you have to keep that data accurate and up to date and that might mean you need to periodically check that the data is still uh, current and, and and accurate um it also means that an individual has a right to tell you that they want you to change their data because it's changed or you know it might be a, a change of address or something like that you should only keep it for as long as you have a lawful reason to do so if you no longer need that data you should be deleting it and if you don't want to delete it because you want to use it for statistical analysis or or, or some other purpose then you should depersonalize it and uh, that's when terms like anonymization and pseudo anonymization come into it where you're basically processing data that isn't strictly personal data because uh, on its own, it, it, um, it doesn't contain any personal identifiers. Um, the principle of security is, is a core and key one and usually is the, the main one that lots of people focus on. So GDPR requires you to basically apply appropriate technical and organizational measures um, to ensure the security and the integrity of the data that you're processing. Um, and that can range from anything from encrypting data on a hard drive to uh, not sharing it with people who aren't entitled to see it, um, to uh, preventing data breaches, to having um, a locked office or putting your computer that's got your data on it in a filing cabinet, which you lock overnight when you're when you're away and, and so forth. And then there's the accountability principle, which is a new principle introduced with GDPR. And, and I got a separate slide about accountability because it covers quite a wide range of expectations and uh but in its essence is that it's up to you to be able to demonstrate your compliance so you can't can't just say well i think i'm doing all the right things you actually have to be able to demonstrate it should you be asked say by the the regulator which in the uk is the information commissioner's office um and also included on that slide in the little blue box in the top left uh because it doesn't quite fit within the other slides is um a set of rules which used to be principles in in old data protection terms but it's now a separate section of gdpr about um, making sure that you have appropriate safeguards in place if the data you're processing is being processed or transferred outside of the european economic area um, and those safeguards will th be things like contracts or if there is an adequacy decision and um, where the eu basically say um that the country uh, for, so, for example, Japan recently, uh, well, probably last year, actually, um, was given an adequacy decision. So that means that Japan was able to convince the EU that their data protection laws in certain circumstances were compliant with GDPR levels of, of compliance. And therefore, 
if you transfer your data and process it in Japan under these specific circumstances that are set out. Similarly for other countries, I, mean, I think Israel's on the list, New Zealand, um, uh, the Channel Islands, I, I, I think, or, or, or some of the Channel Islands, but there's a list of about probably eight to 10 countries. If you process those, the data in those countries, they've got an advocacy decision and that is seen as an appropriate safeguard. For any other country outside the European Economic Area, you've got to look and see what the options are. And to be honest, those options are not to process data in those countries or to make sure that there are contractual terms in place binding whoever is doing the processing in that non-EEA uh, country to uh, GDPR terms. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about this uh, towards the end of the presentation because um, if GDPR wasn't exciting enough, we're going to be talking about Brexit as well. And, um, and there's some connotations around the UK leaving the EU at the end of this transition period and what that will mean from, from a GDPR perspective. So those are the rules and or the, or the principles of, of data protection. Um, for data processing to be lawful, you have to assign a lawful basis of processing to whatever processing activity you do. So if you are processing data for whatever reason, you must make sure that it is lawful for you to do for do so and there are six lawful bases by which it would be lawful. The most commonly known one that most people think about is consent. So this is somebody giving you their permission. Um, the GDPR rules changed a lot so um, now you can only say that you've been given consent when the individual was properly informed as to what they were consenting to and that they have um, understood enough to be able to give you an affirmative action and therefore give you that permission. And you have to demonstrate you've been given that. So you have to keep a record of the consents that are, um, that are given. Um, this drove um, a, sort of a manic approach from everybody who thought that they need to get consent for everything. And uh, if you were um, involved in business in any way, I'm sure, or even as an individual, you probably got bombarded in uh, probably close to May 2018 with a load of consent requirement messages. This was because everybody was panicking that they didn't have your consent to, to, to process data and particularly for, for email lists. Um, lots of people destroyed unnecessarily their, their databases um, for, for that reason. Um, and there still to this day continues to be a, a sort of a lack of understanding that you um, and an, an assumption you must have consent for everything. But just because consent is at the top of the list, just because consent is um, at the top of uh, everybody's minds in terms of what it is that uh, you need to do to be to be lawful doesn't mean it's the most appropriate. And if you're going to do something with data that uh, you've asked for consent and somebody has said no, they don't give you that consent, you can't do that processing. So it's important that you think of consent as very binary. You either do get consent or you don't. There's nothing you can do to change that. You can't say, well, actually, it doesn't matter that you don't think we should process your data that way. I've got a legitimate reason to do it or anything like that. That's it. If you've asked and they've said no, you can't process that data. So what you need to do is actually look at what the other options are. So if you're collecting data because you need that to enter into a contract or you are delivering a product and service and therefore essentially a contract, it doesn't need to actually be a contract per se from a legal point of view, but you're collecting data for, to fulfill a particular purpose where that purpose is clear to the individual, then you would say your lawful basis is a contract. So for example, if somebody fills out a contact form or inquiry form on your website, you don't then also need to ask them for consent to actually respond to the inquiry. It's given that they're giving you the information so that they can you can get the, the answer um, they, they can get the answer from from you as to whatever their inquiry is about. And so you would say that that is being processed as a, a, a from a contract point of view. And obviously, if somebody gives you their their name and address so that you can dispatch a product to them, you too wouldn't need to ask them consent to dispatch the product and write it on the back of an envelope. It would be uh, you're doing that because you need that information to fulfill the contract or the agreement with the customer. Agreement is probably a better word. You may have a legal obligation to process the data. Um, so if a law, you may be in a regulated environment or there's a piece of legislation that applies to your processing. Um, if you don't need the data anymore, but the law says you need to keep it for longer, then you would say you have a legal obligation to process data in that particular way. Um, so typical examples would be uh, tax law. You're, you're required to keep six years plus um, the current year of records for the processing of, of for tax purposes, so that if the tax inspector decided to come inspect you, you would be able to have all the records to hand. So that means if you've got copies of 
of uh, invoices with customers' names and addresses on it. You're processing personal data, but you're keeping that because you want to be able to demonstrate to the tax man that you had that um, that, that purchase or, or these are the people that you um, were selling to, for example. And as I say, in some regulated environments, there are other requirements of, of data. And in that scenario, if the law tells you you've got to process data in a particular way, that you don't need to worry about which of these lawful basis you need, uh, applies other than it is a legal obligation and therefore you should do that um, according to that law. There is a circumstance called vital interest, um, which is basically a life or death scenario. If the data subject is unable to give consent to the processing and their life depends on it, you can process their data. So that's kind of a scenario where say an employee collapses at work, but you know something about them which will help the paramedics uh, you know, save their life or, or, or get them to hospital quickly, you don't need to consider what, what's my lawful basis for processing, um, assuming that the, uh, the individual is not able to communicate that information um, themselves. You would say you've got a vital interest in, in processing the data for, for the purposes of saving that employee's life. Some organisations um, can rely on the public task. So these are typically public bodies, so people who uh, act in the, the role of government or in education. So schools, for example, um, they carry out the processing of pupil data in the public task because they're governed by the, the government to um, basically provide education to, to children. Um, Organisations who act on behalf of um, public bodies and people who rely on public tasks can also say that they rely on public tasks for certain types of pr processing. Um, and then probably um, coming in at number two after consent in terms of well-known uh, knownness, I'm not sure that's the right word, um, is legitimate interest. So this is um, your organisation being able to demonstrate that you need to process this data for a particular purpose and that it's not harmful to the rights and freedoms of the data subject, but you've got a legitimate reason to, to, to be doing it. And um, a lot of people tend to think, actually, if I just claim legitimate interest for everything, then I, um, then I don't need to worry because legitimate interest sounds like a sort of a, a, um, a get out clause, but it's not that simple. There is a, an assessment called a legitimate interest assessment, which you should use as a documentary evidence that you've considered that it is lawful, that there really is a reason for you to process that data in, in that way, and that you wouldn't be able to achieve something without doing so, and that there is no harm to the data subject from, from that uh, processing. Um, so for example, and um, sort of in, in, in including consent here in this example, if you collect data for the purposes of carrying out credit checks for customers, and that's your standard process, because you'd want to make sure that somebody's not going to become a, a, a bad debtor to your, your organization or your business, then you would say you have a legitimate interest to share that data with a credit controller to do the credit control checks. You can't ask for consent to do that sharing because somebody can say no, and if they say no, you can't share the data and do the credit check. So if that's against your process and you've got a good reason for doing that process, then um, you're, you're completely stuffed if, if you use consent and somebody says no. So therefore you would say you have a legitimate interest to, to do that in the interests of your business. There is no harm to, to the individual because um, that's a common practice and you wouldn't be able to ascertain whether they're a good creditor or not um, unless you carried out that duty. Um, and I said about special category data as well, that there's um, additional processing conditions um, for special category data and, and also for criminal offence data. So as well as identifying a, um, a lawful basis for processing that special category data, you also have to identify either an exemption or um, one of the special conditions. And, and the special conditions are covered in the GDPR, but are also covered in um, Schedule 1 of the um, the uh, Data Protection Act 2018. All your data subjects have rights, and these are the individual rights, of which there are eight. Um, and uh, the probably most well known one is the right to be informed. So, Article 13 and 14 of GDPR basically says that an individual has a right to understand how their data is being processed. This is why we have privacy policies. Um, and it means that for every data subject you process data for, they should be able to find some privacy information or have been given privacy information to explain what's going to happen to their, their data. Um, Article 13 relates to data you collect directly from the, an individual. If you collect data from a third party or from the public domain, then Article 14 also requires you within a month to tell them that you have their data 
what you're going to be doing with it, where you got it from, and, and, and so forth. So the right to be informed is a, is a pivotal part for, of anybody's uh, compliance. The right of access or subject access requests, or DSARs as they're sometimes called, um, this is a right for an individual to say, are you processing data about me? If so, tell me what that data is, provide me with a copy, um, and uh, there's some additional things the GDPR requires you to say, like who to complain to and uh, what other rights exist, um, for, for example. Um, you used to be able to charge £10 plus VAT um, to, do, uh, to respond to these within 40 days. Under GDPR, you can't charge unless there's uh, evidence that uh, the request is essentially malicious um, and you have to deal with it within a calendar month. And that's uh, so that's essentially the same day in the following month. So if you get a request on the 29th of January, you've got until the 28th of February to deal with it um, unless it's a leap year, in which case you can do it on the 20, up until the 29th of February. A right to rectification is a right for an individual to have their data corrected. So if they believe that the information you store on them is, is wrong, then they have a right to, to uh, uh, change that. And that ties in with the, um, with the principle of, um, of uh, keeping data accurate. Um, the right to be erased, uh, sorry, the right to erasure or the right to be forgotten. Um, this was a new one introduced by the GDPR, but it essentially means that somebody can say to you that they don't think you should have their data anymore and, and they want you to delete it. It's not an absolute right, though. So if you've got an, uh, a reason to continue to have their data, then um, you can continue to process it for that, that reason. You just have to explain that to, to the individual. Right to restrict processing is somebody telling you that they don't want you to process their data for a particular purpose um, or for over a particular uh, a time. Um, right to data portability is a right to get a machine readable export of um, the data that you have collected directly from them. Um, so this is kind of being able to allow people to port between one service provider to another. The idea is that you will either provide a, a sort of like an API between your, your systems and some other systems so that they can just move the data across and set up a new account. I, you know, obviously with a, a competitor in, in that kind of example, but uh, an individual can get a, a, you know, a CSV version of, the, of their data in a spreadsheet or something so they can do whatever they like with, with that. It's not a, a subject access request per, per se, because it only is, is limited to only data that they have provided to you um, where you've relied on, on consent or um, and I think also legitimate interest for the processing. Um, and uh, it may also include some of the processing data from the process you're doing. So, you know, if you're a switching an energy provider, you've got a right to get a machine readable export of the information you've provided and also meter reading so that you can set, get, send that to the new provider and they can get you set up um, much quicker. Uh, the right to object is uh, basically a, a data subject has a right to tell you that they don't want you to process their data full stop. Um, and um, this ties into marketing because the right to withdraw consent to marketing or even to the right to object to marketing is an absolute right. So um, an individual um, may have given you consent to do marketing, but 10 minutes later, they can, if they wish, tell you that they don't want that to happen anymore and you've got to honour that. And that's why we have unsubscribes in emails and why there's some strict rules around um, making sure that people can withdraw their consent if they, if they need to. Um, and then finally, there's uh, some uh, sort of rights around automated decision making and profiling. So this is where um, essentially technology is used to make a decision from the processing of data where there's been no human interaction. Um, and that leads to a legal um, outcome for an individual. If that's the case, an individual has the right to say that they want a human to intervene and make a decision themselves based on a human rather than um, using artificial intelligence or, or machine learning. So, um, so these are the rights of the individual. So your data. So you may, for example, have obligations like the right to be informed, which requires you to do certain things, or um, from a right of access, you may get things from individuals asking you to hand over the data that you process about them, rectify it, change it, object to withdrawing consent for marketing um, and so forth. And then finally in this section, the accountability principle. So I said I'd come back to this because it covers quite a, a, a wide range of, of expectations. So again, this accountability principle is about proving your compliance. Some organizations are required to have a data protection officer. 
if they're mandated by law, then the GDPR sets out certain things around the criteria of how they operate, how they report within a business and, and so forth. Um, not everybody will need to have them as only certain circumstances. If you're a public body or if you process large quantities of a special category of data or you do large amounts of um, monitoring of data subjects, then you will probably need a, a data pr uh, protection officer. People, businesses typically have a data protection officer or a manager that's not mandated by law, but is the single point of contact or responsibility for data protection compliance. And that's good practice because that means that you've got somebody taking that responsibility and making sure you're doing all of, all of the right things. Um, and so uh, that can be, uh, you know, can be somebody internally making sure that they're the, the central point of contact and the central point of making sure everything is, is following the law, or you can use uh, an outsource provider as well. You have to by law, provide a register of processing activities. And that is whether you're a controller or a processor, there are certain things you have to record. And the, the concept is that if the information commissioner wanted to know what data you're processing, you have to hand over this register. So it's important that you audit what data you have that you're processing and document this in a register of processing activities. And the information commissioner provides on their website a, a, a template you can use for, for that um, basis. Um, I mentioned legitimate interest assessments as something that you would carry out to document that you believe a legitimate interest uh, is, is correct. So that's another documentary piece of evidence, as are things like data protection impact assessments, which are on the other side of, the, of this uh, diagram. Uh, data protection impact assessments are essentially a risk assessment of the data processing activities, so you can identify risks from the processing and mitigate those risks, and also, depending on what you're doing, make sure that you're following the principle of data protection by design and by default, which is uh, an, another element of, of, of GDPR and, and how you manage data um, by default. Um, and I skipped past policies and training. So uh, I think if you know, people often ask me, what's the minimum I, I need to do? Well, you need to have a date, the register of processing activities. So you need to have carried out that data audit and documented your data processing activities. Um, but because if you don't know what data you're processing, how can you be compliant? But also, how can you be compliant if you don't have internal processes or policies that dictate what it is that you expect from your employees or how you handle data? And if you don't train your employees to understand the basics of GDPR, again, how can you demonstrate that you're compliant? Because if you've got an employee that doesn't know that they're not allowed to do something with personal data, you can't demonstrate that everybody's compliant because you've got uh, employees not really knowing what they're supposed to be doing. So the, the idea is you have training to uh, make sure that people don't become privacy experts, but they understand the basics, but with the key objective of making sure that they have a baseline understanding and can reflect on how data protection impacts, uh, sorry, how data protection impacts their day job. And that's backed up by a suite of policies that sets out how you deal with certain circumstances like breaches or subject access requests, but also sets the, the framework for, for compliance within your organization. So of the three things that I would say that any business should be doing is record which process and um, what data kind of data you're processing under what circumstances and get policies and training in place. You are also required to carry out due diligence um, on third party processes. So remember that wider definition of processing will mean your CRM or your cloud based service will be a processor. So if there are any processes you're using, you have to a make sure they're GDPR compliant and B, you have to make sure that there are contracts in place, which are typically called data processing agreements, um, which uh, the terms of which are dictated by Article 28 of GDPR. So um, GDPR actually tells you what needs to be in that contract. Um, and it's important, it's a responsibility of the controller, but sometimes processors have these all, all um, to hand so that they can um, kind of control that process and also take away the burden from, from their clients. Um, but you have to make sure that the processor is GDPR compliant and you have to make sure that there is a contract of some form that relates to the data protection requirements of Article 28 um, in, in GDPR. Um, and then there's some other things in addition to that, the ICO uh, um, and potentially other regulators, although that's probably less relevant as we come to the end of 2020 with leave, leaving um, Europe, um, can publish best practice or sector codes or um, uh, 
codes of practice, even certification schemes um, to, uh, you know, sort of rubber stamp your compliance. Um, there aren't any ICO codes of practice, uh, sorry, any ICO, uh, so there are ICO codes of practice, but there are not very many um, codes of practice or um, certification schemes that have been approved by the ICO from outside of what the ICO offer. Um, but it's always worthwhile keeping an eye on those best practice guides and the codes of practice because whilst they may not be binding on you legally, because GDPR is, but the codes of practice um, aren't strictly uh, binding legally, it's difficult for you to defend why you did something if a code of practice tells you you shouldn't be doing it that way. Um, so the ICO do bear these codes of practice in, 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 uh, in, in their assessment of, of any particular issue. And then something that's very often forgotten is that GDPR wasn't just about the 25th of May 2018, it's about maintaining your ongoing compliance. So you have to think about what it is that you're going to be doing that will ensure that every day you work, you are also always uh, GDPR compliant and, and making sure you're still compliant. So if you carry out a snapshot data audit right now, in a year's time, will you be processing different data? How, how would you know? Well, you review your data audit document to see that you whether there's anything new that you need to add into that. Um, so uh, having a regular process or a framework for maintaining your compliance is, um, is essential as well. Um, and I mentioned breaches briefly earlier. Um, another obligation, not necessarily accountability, but another obligation under GDPR, which is in the top left hand corner in the blue box, is that um, the uh, GDPR introduces um, the requirement to report certain types of breaches where there's a, a risk to the data subject. Um, you have to tell the information commissioner about the breach. Um, and if you uh, if the if the risk is high risk to the individuals, you've got to tell the individual data subjects as well. Um, and it's important to remember that breaches aren't just about spotty teenagers hacking into computers. And so it's not just cybersecurity events. It could equally be somebody seeing data that they're not supposed to because they've been CC'd into an email. It could be um, the sharing of, of data to the wrong customer, uh, sending letters to the wrong person that's got personal data in it relating to somebody else and, and, and so forth. Um, so uh, you have to consider that wider um, understanding of what constitutes a data breach and then assess on a case by case basis because there will be a lot of context to it as well as the scale of the of the breach to consider as to whether it's reportable or not so that's the introduction to G gdpr um, and and covering off the the basics so what what's i mean we're now two and a half years in since gdpr came into force so so what's happened since then um, if, if well, I mean, it's it was it's always tempting to just put on this slide not much because um, there is very little enforcement, for example, from from the information commissioner. There's quite a bit across Europe um, collectively, but um, I think the ICO beginning to be known for for not really enforcing under under GDPR. They've been doing enforcement actions, but a lot of those um, were catching up with cases that happened before GDPR came in. And so fines and investigations were done under old data protection. But so far, two and a half years, we have two cases that have led to a fine, um, a £275,000 fine for a pharmacy that was leaving records of patient data in boxes in a, in a yard where there was public access to the yard and also the data was damaged because um, it was uh, getting wet and uh, wasn't stored very well. Um, so they were fined to 175,000. And you probably saw last week, I think it was, um, that British Airways um, was fined 20 million pounds for a website breach where somebody had managed to hack into all of their systems and change a website to redirect payments. So essentially the third party was scraping full credit card details for people buying tickets off of the website so that um, they then had the credit card number or the payment card number, the expiry date, the name on the card and, and the security code on the back as well, which of course enables people to, to buy things online. Um, they were originally, uh, the ICO originally published uh, last year, yeah, last year, an intention to find BA 183 million, but on reflection, um, whilst BA sort of contested that fine, um, I think the core reason why it went down to 20 million was more of a reflection of the impact coronavirus has had on the aviation industry and the fact that, you know, BA are talking about having to make people part time or, or redundant and that they're going to make a loss this year 
um, adding um, a massive fine to uh, British Airways to, uh, on top of that uh, didn't seem reasonable when the ICO allude to that in, in their report as to where, how they came to that, that figure. Um, you, you may have your own opinions as to whether you think that's fair or not. Um, and uh, I've certainly seen commentary around the fact that, um, you know, uh, US companies like Facebook were fined half a million under data protection, which is the maximum fine. Um, so is that comparable with the, uh, you know, what's happened with BA and, and, and so forth? Um, and in fact, there's some people are saying that the fact that the 20 million fine for BA was well off um, the hundreds of millions it could have been, um, is could be a reason why the EU might decide that um, post Brexit we we wouldn't have adequate data protection because we're not enforcing it um, properly. Um, so uh, yeah, so there's some certainly some challenges there in, in and different opinions as to whether that's effective. But from an enforcement point of view, just because there's only been these two fines, probably you've only ever heard about the British Airways one um, and maybe the intention to find Marriott hotels um, last year and 99 million, which we're still waiting to see what the outcome of that one is. And doesn't mean that they're not doing anything. They get tens, if not hundreds of thousands of reports and complaints and queries um, from people and they're investigating these. And just because they don't make mainstream media or indeed end up in enforcement notice doesn't mean that businesses aren't being contacted by the information commissioner to get their side of a story so that they can then assess them as to whether they're, um, uh, whether they're compliant or not. So um, all of the reasons, all the things we've covered in terms of that um, overview of GDPR apply because, um, you know, if somebody, you don't know if somebody's complaining, that could be a, a disgruntled employee, it could be some customers who felt that you shouldn't have contacted them via email in the way that you did. If the ICO are investigating, they will contact you and want to know what you've been playing at and you need to have good, some good answers to uh, make sure that it doesn't come into an enforcement, um, particularly if it was something on, on a large scale. Um, the ICO do carry out audits. They're typically what they call consensual, which means they'll say um, they would like to come and audit you and they set out a framework of what that audit might look like and they publish the results of that. And both, both the enforcement notices and the consensual audit reports, which they produce a summary of and, and publish publicly, um, they actually give you some clues as to how the ICO are thinking about certain things. So it's important that you pay attention to those as well. Um, I mentioned codes of practice earlier. There's a number of codes of practice the ICO are working through. They've published an age appropriate design code. There's a draft direct marketing code. There's an AI framework. There's an accountability framework. And I'll talk about those towards, uh, towards the end in a bit more detail. Um, they've produced lots of guidance. This, this week they published, uh, or the end of last week, they published a, a, an update to their subject access request guidance. Um, which uh, I think doesn't probably give us any more clues than, than we had before. It just sort of gives you, uh, gives you a few pointers uh, in, in a bit more detail. Um, and then over on the right, and we'll, we'll talk about this in, uh, towards the end as well. Um, recently, a European court declared that one of the appropriate safeguards for transferring and processing data in the US has been deemed invalid um, because of the US government's security law allows them to basically grab information from US providers. So if you're if you're processing your data with Google, for example, in a spreadsheet, um, then um, if they are relying on, if they were relying on Privacy Shield, which they, they don't, but if they were relying on Privacy Shield, um, Google would have no choice but to hand over that data. And that same issue has been raised as a reason why other contractual obligations and, and uh, the appropriate safeguards may not be appropriate for, for dealing with US businesses. But um, I'll leave you hanging with that because we'll pick that up towards, towards the end. So stuff has happened. It's probably a bit unfair to say that not much has happened, but it depends how you want to grade that. If you're looking for fines, then not much has happened. But um, there's gradually been um, information and guidance being rolled out. Arguably, the codes, the guidance could have been there. Could be we could have done with that in 2017, not uh, you know, 2020 or 2019. So what are the key issues to think about? Um, so from working with different types of businesses, all shapes and sizes, um, different sectors, the, the common things that people have challenges around are things like being clear about what personal data is being um, processed. So I get a lot of people saying, well, we're not processing personal data, we've just got their name. Well, that's still potentially personal data or I'm not processing any personal data because we're business to business and we don't process any uh, we don't sell to consumers, so therefore we're not processing consumer personal data. An employee's data, whether that's your employee or an employee of another uh, 
company that you may interact with as a supplier or um, as a customer is still their personal data just within the confines of, of them being an employee. So um, don't forget your employees when you think about a data protection compliance and certainly don't think you're not processing personal data because you're just B2B. Um, most businesses in one way or another will be processing personal data because otherwise you'd be sat on your own not dealing with any real people. Um, there's some struggles that I covered with when you're talking about the lawful basis for processing, particularly around when you should and shouldn't use consent and when uh, legitimate interest is, is, is appropriate. People tend to either default to one or the other and not consider actually it could be contract or it might be a legal obligation. So it's important to understand whether you're uh, applying the right lawful basis to your processing and you should really be able to demonstrate you've chosen the right lawful basis and document that in your, your register of processing activities. Remember, not all breaches are reportable. I talked about that earlier as well. Um, only uh, risk to data subjects have to be reported to the ICO and only high risk um, breaches have to be reported to the data subjects. But you need to consider those on a case by case basis. Um, and it won't necessarily mean that you have to report the ICO, but there are obligations to record them, whether you report them or not. There can be complexities around subject access requests. Um, I, I work with a load of uh, schools and in the education sector, and there's um, uh, 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 issues there with, you know, whether a pupil's data is a pupil's data or whether it's uh, accessible to their parents or not. So if a parent submits a subject access request, are they entitled to the data? What if the parent, if the people says no, you know, all those kind of things. So there can be some complexities and, and sort of uh, issues around interpreting what you should or shouldn't be disclosing, let alone dealing with a disgruntled person who wants you to disclose everything where you're wanting to try and nail down to the specific thing so that the, uh, the uh, subject access is less burdensome. Uh, pretty much everybody um, in one way or another may have issue around data retention. It's so easy to forget you've got data and you keep it, whether that's because you've duplicated it locally or because um, you've just got unlimited amounts of cloud storage and you store stuff in the cloud um, without really thinking about it. But that principle still exists, only keep data that you have a lawful reason to continue to process. Um, so it's important that you have a data retention policy and a schedule that sets out the expectation of what needs to be deleted when and under what circumstances, what you need to keep and, and, and so forth. Um, marketing compliance is, is always a challenge. Um, lots of people think you just need consent for everything. Um, and that works in two ways. Uh, you think that you might not be able to do what you want to do from a marketing point of view, but also the fact that you can do some types of marketing um, leads people to think that you can't. And therefore, that causes a bit of a, um, uh, a bit of friction um, between both parties. Uh, and I've got a, a quick summary of the um, marketing compliance rules on the next slide, which uh, I'll touch on briefly. Um, and then the key thing, as I mentioned, again, I mentioned before, GDPR is ongoing. It's not a one-off exercise. It's not about tick, uh, box ticking or tick boxing, as I was about to say. Um, it's about making sure you're maintaining that compliance. And on the note of um, marketing rules, GDPR didn't change the, the electronic marketing rules. The Privacy and Electronic Communication Regulation set out the marketing rules and they sit alongside GDPR. When the marketing rules say you need consent, that's now GDPR consent. So there's the, the stricter rules around when you do need consent. But the rules around what you do with electronic marketing, which is phone, email, SMS, text, uh, social media, messaging, um, and uh, B2B marketing and B2C marketing are all governed by the PECA rules. Now, I'm not going to go through this in a lot of detail. There's a, a summary poster that's available for free off of my website. The link's at the bottom of the, the page there. Um, but uh, if we just touch on email marketing very simply right now, um, if you are email marketing to consumers, you must have consent before you can send that marketing. You can't ask them for that consent because that is marketing in itself. So you have to rely on them coming to you, like signing up to a newsletter or visiting your website and ticking a box to say they want to receive your marketing and, and, and so forth. There is an exemption to that is that if um, if somebody is your customer, provided they were given the option to say they didn't want your marketing, you can market to them. If you're marketing purely to businesses, if they're sole traders, they're treated like consumers, so you'll need consent. Otherwise, if they're limited PLCs, limited liability partnerships and so forth, you don't actually need consent 
Um, but what I do have found working with some clients um, who do B2B marketing and do sort of cold emails, as it were, um, they find that business people think that you can't do this anymore. And so they, they kick up and uh, can cause uh, problems and you have to deal with subject access requests that you wouldn't normally need to do. So you just need to be mindful of that. But essentially, individuals and sole traders, you need consent. Business to business marketing, you don't need consent. But regardless of what kind of marketing you're doing, everybody has a right to object to that marketing and withdrawing any consent that you might have got. So if somebody says they don't want your marketing anymore, that's it. You can't market to them. Um, you can't even think, well, actually, if I send them this, they'll get a voucher and that's got to be of, of interest. If they said they don't want your marketing and the voucher would constitute marketing, you still can't send them that voucher. Um, there are things you can send, like service messages that would impact their use of your service or um, or something that uh, relates to that, like your, your change of your privacy policy or whatever. Um, but uh, marketing materials, you have to be very careful, make sure you've got the, the right consent um, and that the individual hasn't told you they don't want uh, to get your marketing anymore. So in terms of a compliance package and what that looks like, um, I sort of set that out as 10 simple points here. One, make sure you've got somebody taking responsibility for your data protection compliance. That doesn't need to be a mandated data protection officer unless you're required by law to have one. But by having somebody um, who is taking that responsibility is you have a central focus for questions and queries, somebody to report a breach, ask questions about subject access, um, which will help support a, a culture of, of GDPR compliance across your organization. You may need to also be registered with the ICO um, to make sure uh, that you pay a data protection fee. And there's a tool on their website that enables you to work that out. Um, if for a, a small business, it's uh, I think it's about forty pounds a year. Um, it gets bigger if you're a massive enterprise. Then you could be paying uh, close to to three thousand. I think it is. Number two, implement training and policies across your organisation so that everyone understands the basics and how it relates to their um, their jobs and their roles, and they've got a reference point in in the form of the policies to understand what they should or shouldn't be doing. And they can then reference also the, the single point of contact, your data protection manager, your data protection officer, who can help them if, they, if they're if they still uncertain. But what you want is for them to think twice before they do something with some personal data to make sure that they are doing it lawfully. And if they are unsure, that they know who to go to to find out. Um, have your register of processing activities and document the kind of processing you're doing. So make sure you know what data you're processing around your business, how you're processing it, why it's lawful, um, and if you need to, document legitimate interest assessments to confirm that you are um, able to demonstrate legitimate interest is indeed a legitimate lawful basis for processing. Put in place privacy policies for all your data subjects. Don't just stick a website privacy policy on your website that only addresses what happens if somebody fills out a form on the website or the fact that you use cookies. You need to make sure that you provide privacy information uh, privacy policies to all of the different data subjects you, you've identified. So if you have your register of processing activities, you should know who your data subjects are and you should have privacy policies for each of those. Um, you can do that as one great big privacy policy on your website, but you can have some separate and deliver them in different ways depending on the audience uh, accordingly. Um, the best thing to look, look for in terms of what I mean by this and, and how broad they have to be is have a look at the Information Commissioner's website. It, you know, it's like a a 10 point section of um, lots of information depending on who you are and how you interact with them. And that's exactly what you need to get covered in your privacy policies. Carry out due diligence on your uh, third party processes and make sure you've got contracts in place that meet the requirements of, of Article 28 of GDPR. Put processes in place for common activities like how to deal with breaches, how to deal with subject access requests, when you need to carry out data protection impact assessments. So uh, GDPR requires you to do that when there's high risks from the processing. So that may be if you're doing special category data processing uh, in a way that's not being processed before, but the ICO actually require you to consider a data protection impact assessment whenever you do something different or new with some data. So that might be moving it from one system to another. Basically carry out a risk assessment around your data processing activities and, and have that documented and, and make sure it's uh, part of the culture of your organization to understand when you need to carry those out um, and if necessary test them to make sure that they work because you might not get subject access requests very often but does your subject access process work for example 
be clear about retention and what you should and shouldn't be uh, getting your your staff to delete after a certain period of time so have a retention policy and an appropriate schedule that sets out the different types of data and how long you keep it you could even if you wanted to document that within your register of processing activities as well make sure you understand where in the world your data is being processed and that there's appropriate um, measures in place to protect that data when it's outside the eu and refresh and repeat to make sure you're still compliant as i said it's not a tick a box ticking exercise it's about ensuring you're always compliant and part of that is number 10 keeping up to date so when you see enforcements coming out when you see consensual audit reports they give away clues as to how the ico are thinking um, and it might give might prompt you to think actually we don't do that maybe we ought to get that in in place likewise guidance comes out as i said there's been quite a bit of new guidance uh codes of practice and sets expectations and and, and so forth so um that's kind of your 10 steps to your your compliance and i'm afraid um depending on how risk averse you are doesn't matter whether you're a one man or one woman band or whether you're a, a, a multinational corporate um gdpr applies um the only thing the ico sort of throw in to try and uh, help smaller businesses is that actually you know consider it from a risk point of view if um, the more customers you have the higher the risk for example the bigger you are the higher the risk and so forth um the number of employees you have may be also a consideration but ultimately this framework these 10 steps to compliance will apply regardless of the size of your business or indeed what kind of business you're doing so let's look at um, some of the current challenges that we're we're facing and some of the the um, as I put it exciting uh, developments in the world of GDPR um, and data protection and privacy um, so this is the section that you're not only getting um, a lowdown on GDPR, but we're going to be covering coronavirus, Brexit. Um, there's a whole end of, uh, of different uh, things that are, are currently affecting the, the landscape for data protection compliance. So let's stick with this opposed, supposed new normal that we're living in right now with coronavirus. Um, businesses are changing the way that they're adopting the way that they work because they're having to get employees working from home or they may have had employees working from home under lockdown and are now finding that actually that works quite well and they can save some money on some offices or that their employees are asking them if they can continue that working from home but what is key is that we're all working differently so if you haven't reviewed your gdpr compliance for the last couple of years then there's a good chance that things in your business have changed sort of naturally as your business develops but also because of challenges like coronavirus. Um, so think about the different ways you're working. And I think the way to also think about it is when we had the initial lockdown in March, um, we were all trying to find our way in working out how we were gonna get through this lockdown where we weren't allowed to go out except for an hour to exercise. Um, and it was accepted that, you know, you would probably, most people would be fumbling along and doing their best but now this, you know, we're now what, um, seven months, nearly eight months into having a coronavirus pandemic in the UK. That means that you can't just do your best anymore. You need to make sure that you're adapting your GDPR compliance to fit with how you're working um, today. So don't think about it as well. You're still doing my, uh, your best. The ICA will take some of these things into consideration, but um, do think about your employees working from home the way you're using different ways of communicating with clients or with employees. So using online video conferencing, you might be using email messaging a lot more and people might be sharing data in different ways that they've not shared before and you need to keep uh, control of that. Your business itself may have changed. You, a, a buzzword of the times is pivoting businesses to, to work in different ways and offer products in different, uh, different uh, solutions in, in different ways. Um, that could impact the way that you're processing data for GDPR and particularly if you're, you know, if you've suddenly gone online because that's the only way that you can reach customers now. That means you need to consider data protection by default um, and uh, design and you need to consider whether you carry out data protection impact assessments and so forth. Um, and then if you are looking at bringing people back to the office, but you've got some COVID security type. Uh, situations where you may be measuring temperatures or you may be doing testing and things like that. You need to think about what you're actually doing with that because that would be special category of data which has got these special controls within gdpr and also um 
do you need to be processing it in the way that you you are and a, a lot of people are recording temperature checks um, and health and safety might be telling you that that's the right way to do but that means that you should only be using that data for that particular purpose and you should be very clear that that is special category data because it relates to health um, uh, sort of on the other side um, is the requirement for hospitality to record people who are in venues so that uh, the test and trace uh, system can work and um, there's been some cases in fact where employees have spotted somebody they like the look of and then have contacted them um, outside of work using the contact details that were given by the individual when they visited that venue that's a misuse of data that was a data breach the employee uh, sorry the employers would have to demonstrate that their employees understand that they're breaking the law and they could go to prison if they uh, if you know if it was proven to be particularly bad um, and that the employers have done everything they can to make sure their employees don't behave in that way so even getting back to some normality but with covid secure types of scenarios there there are data protection uh, ramifications and, and uh, some free resources on my website uh, about things to consider in, in this particular area Brexit. So at the end of 2020, we will be looking at um, the end of the transition period. So right now and since 2018, we've, be, we've had European GDPR applying in the UK and that has continued through the transition period. Post the transition, we will no longer be treated as part of the European economic area for the purposes of GDPR. So we will no longer and be seen as part of Europe. And that means that we will be no different than um, the US or India or China um, or any other country outside of, of Europe. So there's always been a hope that we would get adequacy decision. There's quite a few reasons why we might not. I mentioned the BA fine as an indication that the, the ICO might not be rigorously enforcing GDPR in a way that the other regulators across Europe might want. But there's a whole host of other reasons um, uh, most recent, the, the national data strategy from the UK government indicated that we want to become a data economy and that um, it kind of hinted that GDPR might be stopping that happening. And of course, the EU went, hang on a minute, what does that actually mean in reality? What are you going to be doing? What are you thinking? Because if you're going to move away from some of the principles of GDPR uh, at some point in the future, then you're not going to be adequate um, from our point of view. So we need more information about that. So. There's a, a general holdup of, of, as you would have seen in the news, the negotiations and when we might get a, a, an answer, are we going down the no deal G, uh, Brexit route or the, the deal with the EU um, and some of the things around the you know, trade agreements, fisheries and all these kind of things is holding up the whole package and that includes data protection. So potentially we could be in a scenario where we are seen as what's called a third country and any processing in the UK by EU organisations would be seen as a restricted transfer and would need to have appropriate safeguards. So that might mean if you work in that way, so if you're a processor, for example, and you have EU customers sending you data to process, they will probably be forcing uh, contracts on you to, uh, to uh, bind you to European standards of data protection. We will have a UK GDPR, which is essentially EU GDPR, but um, purely for the UK. So in, in theory, nothing is really changing. And what, what this means in reality is if you are UK only, so you're a UK business targeting UK individuals and do all your processing um, as you do under GDPR right now, then nothing's really going to change. But as I said, if you're uh, operating in the UK and processing data on behalf of EU organisations, then there's probably going to be uh, a lot of toing and froing about standard contractual terms. If you target, if you operate from the UK and target EU individuals, so you're targeting EU consumers, then you will probably need to have an EU representative as well. So somebody who represents you in the EU. Um, and uh, everything else is probably going to be the same. Um, so if you're an international business, then there, there are certainly connotations here. And, and likewise for non-EU organizations targeting UK citizens, then they may need a UK representative as well as an EU representative. All of this needs to come out of what happens in the in at the end of this transition period. But from the 1st of January 2021, we could find ourselves as being whilst we have nationally the same kind of law, but we will be seen as the same kind of country from a data protection point of view as as India, China, 
um, the Middle East, uh, the US and, and so forth. So, so there's some challenges there. And at the moment, we've got to wait and see what, uh, what the outcomes of the Brexit negotiations mean for, for GDPR. Um, so something for you to keep an eye on. In fact, this whole section is all about things that you need to keep your eye on. Um, some of you may have spotted that uh, in, in uh, I think it's July, um, there was a case which is referred to as Schrems 2 after the guy who started it, which is a guy called Max Schrems, um, to basically questioned, it was around Facebook. Um, Facebook's European headquarters are in uh, Ireland. So the I Irish regulator was asked to confirm whether Facebook transferring European citizens data out of data centers in, in Ireland to the US for processing for the provision of Facebook services was lawful given that in the US there is a regulation which allows the security services to force US companies to hand over data. Um, and the court agreed that actually if the US services, uh, security services can get US businesses to hand over data without any discretion about whether they're European citizens, whether they're relevant to a certain, um, an investigation or whatever, then they're not being bound by Privacy Shield, which is a, a which was an agreement that if a company in the US signed up to Privacy Shield, they'll they'll follow the GDPR principles. So Privacy Shield as appropriate safeguard for US processing was deemed invalid. And for the same reasons that was invalid, the court said, this also means that under some circumstances, the standard contract clauses, which is the kind of the, the last option in terms of appropriate safeguards may also be invalid. What we're looking for is some guidance here from the regulators the ICO have said that you need to carry out a risk assessment, but it's not entirely clear what you're risk assessing. Um, so, for example, Google is one of these com companies that's answerable to this regulation called FISA, F-I-S-A, something like the Foreign Intelligence Service Act or something like that. Um, and uh, that means if you store your personal data in Google's cloud, so you may have a Google sheet full of personal data, that means that Google could potentially have to hand that data over if they receive one of these notices. And we know that Google do get these notices because it's public knowledge that they do. So does that mean you should, we should stop using Google? Google say, don't worry about it, but then it's not for them to worry, it's for the controller. So it's for us to worry about whether we issue those services. We just don't know. So right now, I, I would say, pay attention to anything that might change in this area, particularly ICO guidance, but just be mindful that you understand where your data is being processed in the world. And if it's in the US and potentially other countries and you're relying on the standard contract clauses for that processing protection, then um, you may need to carry out some more risk assessments. But what that risk assessment is for is, is difficult to say at this point, which is quite unhelpful, but uh, unfortunately um, there's not much else um, that we can do about it at this point. I think most people are just sort of waiting to see what happens. Um, and as I mentioned, there's some new ICO codes. So Information Commissioner's Office have published um, some codes. I've highlighted the three sort of three key ones. There's some others. There's um, an AI framework that's been published recently as well, um, and a few other things around their regulatory controls as, as well. Um, the age appropriate design code applies to any organization that offers online services that are either aimed at or likely to be used by children. Um, so particularly useful in the ed tech se sector, for example, and they set it, it sets out a framework of, of, of around 15 different things that need to apply to your processing from making sure that privacy is on by default to making sure children understand that their parents can see what they're doing um, to some of the common obvious things. But this framework is an expectation of what compliance should look like if you're running those kind of services. Equally, another um, framework that's just been published this has come out in the last month um, is the ICO's accountability framework so this is the accountability principle at, at work and, and it basically sets out a very wide set of um, hints essentially hints and tips as to what the ICO expects to see when you're demonstrating your compliance and whilst it's very much risk-led there are things in there that some businesses will probably think actually we don't do that and we probably need to have that put in place and that could be anything from governance structures internally through to how you deal with third party processes, should you be auditing them and making sure that, you know, is, how can Google demonstrate its compliance when you use Google Sheets, um, particularly around the Privacy Shield and all this kind of thing that's going on. So, so, so some pretty big challenges potentially 
um, there from the accountability framework. This is a, a new framework which they've introduced, which I, I think is relatively helpful. It's quite broad, so it's quite detailed, a lot for you to take in, but it's quite helpful in understanding how the ICO are thinking and interpreting a, a lot of the regulation. And then finally, it's in draft. I don't know when we get it's been consulted on um, earlier this year. I don't know when we're going to see it. When it's finalised, the direct marketing code, which is an update to an old code um, from previous data protection regime times, um, will need parliamentary approval. But it sets out mainly what we know already about the privacy controls, but potentially um, how GDPR interacts with those. So what does GDPR consent mean when you're doing lead generation? What does GDPR mean when you're using email addresses of your customers to find similar audiences on Facebook and, and similar uh, types of processing? So it's actually quite useful. And I would suggest that you use that as a basis of your marketing uh, ways because that is uh, most likely to be not too dissimilar from what the final code will look like. Um, and it gives some pretty useful hints and tips as to what the expectations are around processing marketing data. So that's the end of what I wanted to cover. Um, I think that there's a lot to be kind of worried about right now um, outside of the obvious things like what COVID is, means to us all and, um, and what Brexit means. But um, there's a lot of uh, movement in, in this area and, and Brexit is certainly going to play a part in terms of where we position ourselves, particularly if you're a, 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 a multinational uh, company. Um, but, um, and here's the self pitch, um, this is where I come in, I'm here to help, I run a, uh, a range of different services but the core service is my GDPR Unlimited service, that gives you some hands-on help, so that's me doing some of the work for you so you don't have to worry about it yourself, as well as uh, unlimited email and phone support, online resources, access to webinars and training. Um, I can act as your data protection officer, mandated or otherwise, if, if you want. And, and the concept there is that you get the help when you need it the most. So if something happens, you need some advice. If it's a client challenging a, a contract or putting contractual terms on you, on you and you're not sure whether that's GDPR or, or just a, um, a, a, an over-exuberant lawyer, um, those are the kind of things I can help you with. And I can also... Um, uh, help do some of the work for you um, but I've got a self-service uh, offering as well you, um, you just basically sign up for a year and you get access to step-by-step uh, -step guides uh, policy templates and, and that kind of thing um, and the GDPR unlimited service I've actually packaged into a, a product which is a three-month uh, membership um, so it's sort of a, a, a retainer system is um, you pay on a monthly basis um, but over that three months you'll get a review uh, a report on what needs to be done and fixed and help getting it uh, fixed. So that's proving quite popular now, but I think because people are two years on from when they looked at data protection last um, and think that they, um, and quite rightly that they need to look at it again and make sure they're still doing the right things. Um, but have a look at my website. Um, um, there's some, um, I've got some additional um, webinars coming up. There's uh, one on the accountability framework in a few weeks time. Um, and I'm also running a, a webinar aimed at non-European um, com companies that um, may need to consider some of the Brexit implications once we know uh, a bit more about what's going on. I'm just hoping that uh, we do know what's going on by the time I run, run the webinar, otherwise I'll need to be running another one a bit later on in the year. So um, I haven't had any questions via chat as we went through. Um, I'm going to stop the recording and stop the screen share and we'll go back to traditional Zoom. Um, feel free to, to ask any questions, otherwise um, that's, that's it for, for this session. Thank you. So let me just...